everyone. Welcome to the lecture on Second Kings and our cover to cover series. I've titled this Let's Go Crazy because things are going to really fall apart for the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdoms of Israel. So here in looking at our timeline, we're starting somewhere in here just before the exile of the Northern Kingdom of Israel. And we are going to cover all of this history until we get to the exile of the southern kingdom of Judah. So by the end of 2 Kings, Israel as it once was is no more. So let's take a look. So as I said, um, with 1 Kings, sorry, this should say 2 Kings here. Um, the, these two books were put into written form sometime during the exile by priests and scribes. Likely Jeremiah was a big contributor to this. It was one united book originally, and it features history and biography. It is the story of Israel with a focus on its leadership. So the structure of 2 Kings, we begin in the first 10 chapters with the Northern Kingdom, also called Israel. And in this story, we have the story of Elijah's successor, Elisha. So he passes the mantle of prophetic authority down to Elisha. We see that Elijah dies and not really um, dies as we would expect him to, but he's taken up by a whirlwind or uh, up into heaven. Um, and so Elisha inherits the double portion. In chapters 11 through 17, we see kind of back and forth of rulers of both the northern and the southern kingdoms. And this section ends in chapter 17 with the northern kingdom being taken into exile because of their sin. And then the final chapters focus solely on the southern kingdom as the northern kingdom is no more. And so we see um, here Hezekiah's reign. He's actually one of the better kings. Then we see some bad kings, Manasseh and Amnon. Josiah is a good king. Um, and then we see Judah. Eventually, the southern kingdom is taken into exile as well. So here I showed you this in the last lecture, but this is just the kings put into chronological order so that you can see uh, the overlapping of their reigns with one another. So something helpful to look at when you're trying to make sense of what you're reading in Kings. So let's talk about the fall of the Northern Kingdom. It's the first to be taken into exile and it's uh, carried off by Assyria in 722 BC. This exile was predicted during the reign of its first king, Jeroboam. And so in 2 Kings, it reminds us of this fact in verses 21 through 23. These tribes do not return. Many of the people of this northern kingdom are killed, and the ones that aren't become so assimilated into Assyrian culture that they form new identities. So unlike the southern kingdom where we're going to see a remnant come back after exile, no remnant will return from um, this once northern kingdom of Israel. So the region becomes populated by the Assyrians and they bring people from Babylon and other near ancient regions to the land. So they take away the Israelites and repopulate it with their own people as well as captives from other nations. But there's trouble in the land as we see in the story. Um, and so they do allow an Israelite priest to go back one, one only, he's allowed to return to lead the people in um, the ways of Israel's faith. Remember, for the ancient Near East, faith was tribal and localized. So you would expect that wherever you lived, that was the god or goddess you would worship. And so the Assyrians are repopulating this area with people from all over the place. Uh, so everyone would have had sort of a different god or goddess that they worshipped. 
But when they came to the region that was once Israel, they would have recognized that the God, prevailing God here, was that God of Israel. So they would have recognized God's authority, not as the one true God, but in their eyes as the God of that region of the ancient Near East. And so that's why they want this Israelite priest to come, because they said, um, you know, we think we're angering the God of this region, and so we need someone to tell us how to worship this God. Uh, so this leads to all sorts of interesting practices, which Second Kings identifies for us. And these people come to be known as the Samaritans. And we will encounter them a lot during the ministry of Jesus Christ. They do not have a good reputation in the turn of the century world, uh, the, the early first century world of Jesus. Uh, and it's because of this. It's because they have some echoes of of Israelite faith in their practices, but they also have some things that look nothing like what Israel does. And it's because it's like a mishmash of all these people from other ancient Near Eastern cultures. So hold that in your thought. There are more, more on them to come in the New Testament. What about the fall of the southern kingdom? Well, as we see, once the northern kingdom is carried away, the southern kingdom is all that's left. So here it can be confusing as well because it's it's known as Judah, but it's also Israel. It's what's left of Israel. So sometimes those names are interchanged. Most of these kings also do evil in the eyes of the Lord, as did the kings of the northern kingdom. But we're going to see that David's line continues. This is because that is what God has promised. Um, the cycle of sin, I said this last lecture, reemerges. That sin that happened in Judges where they would sin and they would cry out for deliverance and God would come to their aid. Uh, but eventually things unravel just as they did in the time of Judges. And so they become oppressed by foreign entities. And uh, we're going to see that... At some point, God's just going to go, that's it. And they too are going to get taken into exile. There's a few bright spots among the kings of Judah. The first is Hezekiah. He stands up to Sennacherib. He removes the high places. He cuts down the Asherah poles. Um, he you know, tries to right the wrongs that have happened in terms of of the southern kingdom. And then we have Josiah. So uh, when Josiah is king, his um, servant Hilkiah finds the book of the law, which means the book of the law had been lost. This, this would have contained the Mosaic law that they were supposed to follow. And he brings it to Josiah, who is rightly horrified that they have not been doing any of the things in there because they didn't even know that they were supposed to be doing these things. So he instigates some co a covenant renewal with the people, but it, it's not enough because in between these two good kings, we had the most wicked king, Manasseh. He is the proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back. It is during his reign that God is like, that's it. I can't, you know, this is done. You have sinned too greatly and you're going to have the same punishment that the Northern Kingdom have. You're going to get taken into exile as well. So let me read that to you. If you have your Bible, it's in second Kings chapter 21, um, verses 10 through 15. And, you know, if you look at this yourself, take some time to read through and see all of the terrible things that Manasseh does, including sacrificing his own son, pr practicing div divination, consulting uh, mediums, just terrible, terrible things. God is not, not happy. So this is what God says. The Lord said through his servants, the prophets, Manasseh, king of Judah, has committed these detestable sins. He has done more evil than the Amorites who preceded him and has led Judah into sin with his idols. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I am going to bring such disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. I will stretch out over Jerusalem the measuring line used against Samaria and the plumb line used against the house of Ahab. So this is referring to what's happened in the northern kingdom. I will wipe out Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance and give them into the hands of enemies. They will be looted and plundered by all their enemies. They have done evil in my eyes and have aroused my anger from the day their ancestors came out of Egypt until this day. 
and I'm going to keep going. Verse 16, Moreover, Manasseh also shed so much innocent blood that he filled Jerusalem from end to end, besides the sin that he had caused Judah to commit, so that they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Whew, that is, that's some harsh words there, but nothing unexpected. Again, go all the way back to Deuteronomy and to Moses' final sermon where he says, here's the punishment that's going to befall you if you do not uphold the covenant. And that is what has happened. So unfortunately, this happens. Then Josiah comes to reign, finds the book of the law, leads the people into covenant renewal. But it's not enough. After Josiah, more evil kings arise and it's just, it's not enough. No human has enough power to turn this ship around. No human has enough power to overcome sinfulness and the natural bent of human beings to turn away from God. Uh, a, a different kind of king is needed, not a human king. Spoiler alert to what's coming in the New Testament. So in 605 BC, Judah is defeated by King Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon. We're going to see him again in scripture. And uh, at the, this is the beginning of the end. So he installs a guy named Jehoiakim as a puppet king um, to rule kind of on behalf of the Babylonians. And then three waves of exile happen. So the first two waves are smaller groups. It's it's usually the leadership, the people who have any kind of wealth and status. They're taken off to Babylon first. And then in 586 BC, they take the majority of Judah, kind of all the rest of the people, into captivity. And as they go, they pillage and plunder and leave Jerusalem and the temple in absolute chaos and ruin. So First and Second Kings ends with the Israelites in a very bad place. But hope remains. So this is fast forwarding to the book of Isaiah a little. Um, but Isaiah, you know, was a prophet during this unfolding horror that has happened. And so he spoke some words of prophecy that should hopefully still be ringing in the ears of these Israelites. And these were Isaiah's words. They'll probably be familiar to you. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So there is the prophecy of Messiah to come, who is going to reinstate David's kingdom, but oh, in such a way that they could never have anticipated. So yes, things end badly, but not without hope. And we're going to see that when we study the words of the prophets in closer detail when we get to their books um, in a few weeks here. So with that, we close out our time in the books of the Kings, and let me close us with prayer. Gracious God, thank you that even on the darkest day, even when all hope seems lost, even when our human eyes see only death and destruction, you have promised us, God, that you are with us and that you love us and that Jesus, as we now know in our time, has come and made a way for all of us to be reconciled to you. So God, I pray that in the midst of our own personal darkness, our valleys, our mountaintops, our ordinary days in between, that we would be aware of your presence, God, that you would show the workings of yourself to us and that we would see you at work of this world. Give us the eyes to see you at work, that we may know that we are never alone. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I'll see you for the next lecture.